Well, thank you for being here for a third day. I hope you had a good second day, if we call it the second as the first day. July 1st was sort of orientation and legend speaking, Jack Shat and, uh, and Deepak Jain, uh, both of whom I know fairly well from way back. And then July 2nd was our first day of presentation. And then July 3rd, yesterday, was uh, Shubha and, uh, and who? Mantrala, well, both had video presentations. They were, they were terrific too. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here for family reasons. Uh, and, uh, and July 4th, today is supposed to be the US Independence Day. So it's equivalent of August 26th for India. And it is, sorry? F yeah, 15th, sorry, sorry. January 26th and August, sorry, my bad. I should know this. Uh, so it's not Republic Day, it is Independence Day uh, equivalent. We don't have an equivalent Republic Day in US, even though uh, the difference between Independence Day and Republic Day is Independence Day is when we got our independence from British rule, and the Republic Day is when all the states, I guess, became one republic. Uh, it is true in US too that a lot, of, first there were only 13 states which are represented in the 13 stars in the US flag. Now we have 52 states, uh, 50 states and plus two states, uh, 50 uh, states on land and two states outside. Uh, anyway, uh, so what I do is I go back and watch the fireworks. The fireworks on July 4th is fantastic. Uh, so I always go when I'm in the US, this is one of the few times that I am outside of U.S. soil, not because I want to watch the fireworks, but because uh, you know, in summer it's better to be there, and in winter, so I usually come to India during winters. But let me quickly go to what we were. So the idea, and for the for all of you who were on the research panel, the idea behind this faculty development workshop is we are seeing a very good and healthy trend among faculty members or professors, marketing or non-marketing professors uh, in the business schools in India, which more or less echoes what we had in US in 1970s, 80s. So in the 70s and 80s, there was, if you see the history of faculty development in US, in the 50s, when the business school started to become popular, all the business school instructors were from the industry. Uh, so, sorry, originally were from economics professors who didn't have jobs in their own or otherwise professors from economics and social sciences in the 50s. Then they became too theoretical and not marketing oriented. So the pendulum swung all the way in the 60s. Even my school, SMU, Southern Methodist University, didn't care a hood about uh, uh, research. During the 60s and 70s, my own uh, school had only consultants. And someone was asking about culture. We only did terrific, a lot of consulting. And, and people thought only those that you bring from the industry is relevant knowledge for. Then that got in totally because everybody knew not about, let's say, uh, cognitive dissonance, but cognitive dissonance as it pertains to IBM or Hewlett Packard or something or theories or marketing phenomena. So then the thing now has slowly come back to what the pendulum is swinging back where we are emphasizing more research but at the same time feel that teaching is also important because that's what is giving us uh, money. So in that process uh, they hired people and gave them, in terms of culture, uh, a lot of uh, first time. The first thing that is required is time, which means we, for instance, I teach only two semester courses because I'm also HOD, but we typically teach three courses for nine credits, each semester credit is. So most of us don't teach only in one semester. Most of our research faculty we have the rest seven or eight months free. At least that's what we try to do. Minimum everybody has at least four hours of time to work on research exclusively if they want to. The second is, uh, so I'm trying to say what will make you good 
uh, researchers. So you have to find the time or you have to ask your administration uh, for time that you can exclusively devote. The second is the incentive. We are a publish or perish kind of environment there. If you don't publish, you don't make tenure, you don't advance and so forth, it is difficult to bring in that system. But the second is to ask for a reward system, either in terms of course, so if someone is an active researcher, uh, so I make the decision whether to give them one course, teaching course load less that they allow so that they can work more on their research. So that's the incentive system. The third is the resources. The resources can come from grants, real funds, do dollars in your case rupees that can be put to buying, you know, doing lab experiments or buying equipments or buying data sets and so forth. So we say we have a pool and that's why I, we run a certificate program and all of the money comes only to the department, nobody else even, only I know, nobody else even knows how much money we have there. And then we use that and to say, if you have a proposal that has good, that has good opportunity for being published in a good journal, then we will fund that. We have never, uh, we have never uh, sent back or we have denied a reasonable funding uh, request. Uh, and the fourth is the, so in terms of the, the resource can also be in the form of external grants and stuff. And the fifth is the infrastructure that we set up. So we have a lab, a digital lab within the, uh, our school, where if you want to run experiments, all you have to do is book time. And then we can even, and we have a subject pool, so to speak. So all our undergraduate students have to have one hour or two hours of lab research participation, or they have to write a paper. And most people want to say we'll rather participate. So we have a sort of a, a free captive subject pool to run your behavioral experiments if, if you want and so forth. And then we have a database, a big, a big computer with uh, a database that we get from Chicago that comes at, for academic purposes. So these are some of the ingredients that you can have to develop a research-oriented atmosphere within your school and you can take it to your dean or your president or whoever it is, your vice chancellor or something and say this is how research-based institutions are developed. And the final is to hire good people either from, from within India or from outside of India. Anyway, with that, so after you develop your research orientation, how do you actually do research and that's what we are here for and these uh, papers are really basis for bringing that out or discussing it. So the first in managerial papers and some person was asking on the, during the panel whether managerial implications are necessary or not for publication. In con behavioral papers it is not. If you are in the managerial track by very, by its definition it should have substantive implication. So in that sense, it is a necessary condition of a certain sort, but it is not a sufficient condition. That is, just because you have managerial implication doesn't necessarily mean that it will be good managerial, that it will be published. It has to be managerial implication, but equally important is whether you've done rigorous research to develop that. And to do rigorous research, we create some templates. One template is the TEM approach that I illustrated with the previous uh, paper. That is, have some theory. That doesn't mean it has to be very deep theory, a good conceptual foundation, or, or uh, and then follow it up with some empirical analysis, which will lead to managerial implication. So that's one of the, my, the second approach, which is, uh, which I'm going to briefly illustrate. I'm not going to uh, talk about, oh, oh I, I don't want to be going too, so much. We can, yeah, uh, let's see. Okay which I want to use this paper. Was this paper also assigned to you? This, oh, it was, okay. 
this is a this is a pure thought exercise what we call armchair uh, development so you just put your arm put your leg on the table or something and just think and start writing your thing now this is a conceptual paper the first is the empirical paper towards managerial orientation so in that sense as i was saying the managerial track itself is somewhat redundant in the sense that people do theoretical work or uh, quantitative work and then bring all of them into addressing some managerial problem now theoretical behavioral people don't think that is necessary but from a managerial track we think it is necessary so this addressing the managerial issue you can apply theory do empirics and also you can simply conceptualize think about how i would be able to solve the problem so there is a conceptual template simply of developing a framework for addre potentially addressing a managerial problem and then i'll talk ab later about uh, methodology methodological route to addressing managerial problem in the brand equity case so this i don't want to have uh, i develop a taxonomy of stored brand strategies and this i first developed you won't and that's why the kind of gestation period there are in some research i developed it in 1990 i gave it to lou stern he read the first 10 pages lou stern who is the guru of channels he was he had just come back from marketing science institute uh, to northwestern where i studied uh, but i gave it in 1990 when after i graduated uh so he wrote the first five pages those days the uh, there was no internet or email or anything so we gave them physical copies and so they will write comments on the side and send it back to you so he wrote he started writing the comments on the side for the first five or 10 pages then he threw it back he sent it right back to me he said this is so much junk raj i don't even want to read the rest of it don't waste my time those were his words so sometimes you get and i don't find fault with him so i just put it aside i said okay there will come a time when i'll get old enough uh, but working on conceptual papers is not good use of your time as young professors or upcoming professors because writing a conceptual paper is very difficult uh, first and even if you can write a good conceptual paper it is <clears throat> very difficult to publish so only people who have attained some kind of a name recognition or some seniority or for whom it doesn't matter whether it is published or not and so even this i ended up publishing it only as a book chapter so if you think of the hierarchy you know a journals b journals c journals whatever and then the book chapter i don't think of now we publish a lot on book chapters because that's the way for us to get our knowledge through but i personally like this because uh, the motivation is much more holistic if you think about traditional view of private labels typically people think they are in commodity products like flour rice bread and stuff where there is not much scope for differentiation they think it generally should be in high volume category so the turnover is high uh positioned as low priced always it's low price so these are fairly zero sum game is a big deal that is it's a win lose situation if store brands get market share they always win market share away from national brands so if you get 5% more market share national brands will lose 5% mar uh, market share and so forth that's a zero sum game usually has higher margins and people think you more private label share you promote okay so this is the conventional wisdom so to the extent that you can thinkers question conventional wisdom uh so i looked at this is a nielsen 2014 uh paper uh, big report on private labels that has quite a bit of data of even on the indian market this is an international private label report so they found that 
Private labels do well in non-commodity products also. In cereal, in diapers, for instance. Uh, diapers are not very popular here, I suppose, but diapers is a high-priced item. Sorry, is it? Oh, it is? Oh, OK. Oh, is that right? So do you have? Oh, is it? And do you have cloth diapers, from what I hear? No, no, no. Non-disposable? No. So. Oh, OK. The real diapers. Who are the brands? What are the brands? Are the da Loves and, uh, OK. Pampers is there? OK. OK, that's a market leader. Do you have Loves, which is Kimberly Clocks? No, Kimberly Clock is Loves. L-U-V, L-U-V. OK, you don't have that. Those are the two major brands over there. Huggies. Huggies is Pampers, Huggies. Yeah, yeah. So those are, uh, but do you have store brands in that? Do you have? Yeah. 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 That has become suddenly very popular. Yes. Procter and Gamble got so uh, arrogant about their dominant position in diapers that they let go of. They said no private label will come in diapers. Who will put a store brand private label diaper uh, in their on their children? You know, baby food, especially people, they were, uh, they thought we will try it out ourselves, but because babies cannot s see that, uh, we cannot know whether babies like it or not. We will never put store brands or private labels on, a, give it to our babies. Baby food, and the same thing with dog food or cat food. In US, dog, uh, people care more about their dogs than their children yes. in many cases. So they will never give private label cheap brand item to dogs because they don't know whether the dogs like it or not, you know, kind of thing. So that's a, but it's suddenly in medicine too, in, uh, generics. yeah, generics have become so popular there. It doesn't mean the others are not doing well. So there is a Tylenol equivalent, Advil equivalent, I don't know what they are. Even equal. Uh, oh, is that right? Cereal you have, okay. Cereal hasn't, I think as a category, cereal hasn't picked up as much, perhaps, as they would have liked to. People, when I come here, I will never touch a box of cereal. I mean, that's what I'm here for. So I'll take my idli and dosa and sambar and chutney, which is a much better breakfast than cereal. Uh, so it is there even in differentiable products. It's positioned as low price now, and I'll show you the data premium, regular, and value brand. So there's a three tiers of store brands themselves that are becoming uh, popular. Do you have it here where there are three tiers or is mostly I found very standard value brands or something or at most economy. So the three kinds of brands that we talk about value or economy brands is the lowest price. The regular or standard store brand is still lower price but it is at least packaged and quality wise they are somewhat compared. So Shopper Stop and uh, Trent and all of them, they are in the regular category. In the regular category, yes. Do you have premium private, I'll show you some because I, do, I did go through some, uh, do you know what a premium store brand is here? That is, sometimes they are the only ones on the, they don't even have a national brand, sometimes. Or they are clearly so well packaged, you almost think it's a store brand. Uh, sorry, national brand. So, cover, cover story. See, most of the brands which come from the models and mm -hmm. designers, uh -huh. they try to position it as premium brands. Oh, is that right? So, so you may have a national brand like Viva, but mm -hmm. you will have a collection from designer, which is, you know, where the yes. cost would be exorbitant. You know, it would be right. multifolds. Right. So, that is how they... In, fa in non-durable goods or non-FMCG goods, uh, there is quite a bit of premiumness and apparel and, and stuff like that. Really, so, this is also in India, uh -huh. like companies like Godrej, uh -huh. they do luxury retailing. Oh, okay, okay. So they, so they, they have a clear is. niche yes, premium. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, oh, is that right? Yeah. That's a. I have one question. Mm. Fab India is another one. Fab India. I know, I know Fab India quite well. Mm. India, we have adult diapers also. That's okay. Uh -huh. So we don't have private tables there. Sorry? We don't have private labels in cattle diapers. Yes, in yes. And uh, that's, that's the whole point about this taxonomy. So I'm trying to find a reason. We have private labels. In cattle diapers, in adult diapers, not regular ones, Taga has in Star Bazaar. It's called Star Bazaar diapers. No, that is a reason different because it's talking about because they have different labels. Yeah. So it's called Star Bazaar diapers. This is for adults. This is baby diapers. Right. So for adults, why don't we have 
They don't have. Most are afraid. In fact, I started doing some research, even in the US, which is supposed to be in UK, it's a little different. They are, the retailers are so scared of exceeding, if they have a national brand, the price of the, they may call it a premium store brand, like President's Choice by Lobla, which is a Canadian, uh, is always a premium store brand. They have uh, frozen yogurt and stuff. But even that, when the, when the leading national brand is, let's say, $2, they are so scared of going at $240 or $250. They'll never price themselves above it. They'll stay at $210, $220, or $190. They'll stay within the range. So that's why I said, the, that's why you always think, what is premium about that premium store brand? And we'll come to that. That's also the kinds of things that I'm uh, trying to understand. What does premium store brand really mean? And how should we price and promote it if, if we want? And when will that be? So, uh, so that's the first myth that we can destroy is that private labels do well in non-commodity products also. Then private labels are not just one type or a three tier. The other that people are now trying to say is, you know, if I win, you lose. Maybe there is a win-win situation. All of us in the business school or when we deal with channels, we are always striving for win-win situation. If I win and you lose, it is not a sustainable equilibrium. If I win and you win, it is something that can propagate. So thinking in terms of win-win situation that uh, and higher margins and higher power, this is also being, there are some like uh, diapers where you may think it is non-existent, but it may have just 1% or 2% market share and still make good money for the private labels because they have priced it and positioned it in such a way. There are some like orange juice where uh, private labels have 40% market share and they don't make money because they have to price themselves so low in order to get that 40% market share that the margins are so thin. But they want it because they want to penetrate the market and keep the market. Even milk, for that matter. In milk, there is 60, in US, 60% market share. But they price it so, uh, Borden, is, which is the only national brand now, is that, let's say, a half gallon will be $2.50. Whereas the uh, private label milk will be 99 cents. One oh, almost less than 50%. And so the, they're not looking for, they saw, those are what we call traffic builders. Somebody was trying to do some research on it. So they use milk and orange juice as their traffic builders for the store brand traffic builders. Sometimes you can have national brand traffic builders, and now they're trying the concept of store brand traffic builders. And people like big ones, I don't know if Costco is here. Uh, do you have Costco? No, you don't have, okay. Costco, Walmart are using their own store brands. Uh, to be to build traffic, which was not, uh, which was unheard of in the pre in the previous uh, era in some sense. So here is the about 17 percent of store brands uh, retailers have three tier program in Europe and USA, not in. Uh, so this is the distribution. So I won't go into the depth of this. This is purely a thinking exercise. You can do research simply by thinking long and hard and deep uh, and being iterative about it. So I wanted to develop a taxonomy. So do you know what a taxonomy is? What is a taxonomy? Have you heard of it? Yeah, it's a classification. And you can develop your own taxonomy when you do your literature review. 
Uh, so, okay. So, here are the ways people have done brand extensions and then bring it down to. So, it is some kind of a reasonable classification of whatever is the phenomenon that you are trying to describe uh, to decide whether what all has been done, what are the ways in which something can be done and, and that gives you an opportunity to find a gap. So, I will not go into the, uh, so I said everything is based on demand supply equilibrium condition or demand supply situation. So, on the demand side, I said let us take diapers since we started on that. How much is a diaper here? 100 rupees, yeah, uh, a pack of 6 or something. 6 rupees per piece? Oh, that is pretty cheap. Oh, okay. So, let us say 10 rupees per piece. There are only about 10 percent of the people who can afford 10 rupees per piece diaper. I mean, we could not. When I was a child, we could not afford. So, we always used reusable cloth in some sense. So, there are a lot of people who cannot. That is the RPC or reservation price for category. Some people will pay more than 10, will be willing to pay more than. Reservation price is the price, maximum price you are willing to pay. Some people will be willing to pay more than 10 rupees for the diaper. Some people say, well, that is too much. If it is 5 rupees, I will buy it, but if it is 10 rupees, I will not buy it. That is called the RPC. Then I wanted to bring the store brand into the picture. So now, as I said in the history, store brand was the first brand that preceded national brands. When we had the caveat mTOR kind of philosophy, with the caveat venditor philosophy, national brand is the primary mover and shaker and store brand, uh, national brand is the leader, store brand is the follower. So, let us say national brand is 10 rupees and you said you know in the diapers, 10 rupees diaper. Now, somebody may say, I am willing to suppose the store brand is coming at 7 rupees. The differential is 3 rupees. Some people may say, I am willing to buy if it is less than 3 rupees price. That is, if it is 10 rupees and 7 rupees, I am willing to buy below 7 rupees. Some people will say, I will buy it so long as it is between 7 and 10 rupees. I cannot buy it at 10 rupees, but I will buy a store brand uh, if it is 8 rupees. And some people say, no, I will buy, even if a store brand comes, I will buy it because I think I am not that uh, comfortable with where, giving a store brand to my baby, I will buy it only if it is 4 rupees or something. That is called the threshold price gap. The maximum price gap that they are willing to pay. It is a slightly dif difficult concept to understand, uh, but it allows me to provide a taxonomy. On the sub so, that is the demand side, that comes from the consumer, it has nothing to do with the producer. Now, we have to meet that with what is on the production side and we are trying to use minimum set of metrics so that always 2 by 2 has become a big thing. You always, if you have 2 by 2, it is easy for, to pe for people to understand and it is easy to put it on a two dimensional picture. So, the first one is break even national brand retail price. That is, if consumers will pay 10 rupees for a uh, Huggies diaper, can Procter & Gamble or Pampers pr produce Pampers for under and sell for under 10 dollars or more than 10 dollars. So, if they can sell for more than 10 dollars, then, then they cannot be a supplier because they want to, the consumer wants to pay, pay 10 dollars, 10 rupees, but you can only produce it at 11 rupees, then you are out of the market. So, the supply does not. So, that is the, that is the break even, you will break even at, if, but if I can break even at 8 rupees, I will offer at 8 rupees and make 2 rupees uh, profit. Okay? So, that is the supply side. The same way I have break even, how much store, what is the minimum price at which store brand can be, uh, can be produced. So, if the store brand can be produced at 
four, five dollars, then the difference and the national brand can be produced at eight dollars, that differential, a cost differential is three dollars. So the threshold price differential should be greater than the cost differential for someone to buy the store brand. So it's a slight fina finance, economics involved in it, but you have to think on those terms in order to make sense of who is going to buy what. So let me uh, talk about, so I divided this, used this two by two to bring about four types, broad types of people. Think of it, this is a conceptual work, so it doesn't mean I have to find it in the real world exactly like it is. I'm thinking aloud, so low-end discriminators, so this is, let's say, 2-1. Let's say this is 20 rupees or 2 rupees for diaper and 1 rupees is the threshold price gap. I'll explain what this is. So the first one, low-end discriminators, these are the people for whom they cannot afford national brands. They are poor people. So if you give them diapers at 10 rupees, they cannot buy it, okay, below the threshold. They are all, that is called the low end. They are the low end people. Discriminators are but they are not willing to buy the store brand easily. That's why they are called discriminators. Discriminators means they can clearly discriminate between national brand and store brand and say that store brand is low quality. So discriminators are those even if the price of the store brand at, is at its minimum cost, they will not buy it. So they will not buy the national brand because it is too high priced for them. So you tell them, oh, you can't buy national brand. So let me give you the store brand at 5 rupees. And they say, no, no, I don't want because I don't believe in the store brand also. That's why they are discriminators. They are not good people. And there is a whole group of market like this, uh, either due to lack of education, lack of familiarity and stuff, even in the US. And most of them are Hispanics. They are so poor, but they will not touch store brand. We will rather not go without, we'll go without it or use cloth diaper, but never buy a store brand sir, because we are, we are uh, afraid of it. So the other end is high-end discriminators, high-end because they are willing to pay more than 10 rupees for a diaper. People like you all, for a national brand. But they are also discriminators, meaning they hate store brands. They don't think store brand really, I will never put a store brand diaper on my baby. That's the kind of attitude that they have. So they will buy the national brand, but not uh, the high end is, they are willing to buy the national brand, but they think they are, there is really no difference between national brand and store brand. They think store brands are just as good or almost as, as good. So the, and low end discriminators, they won't buy, buy but they are willing to buy national brand. Uh, store brand. Non-discriminators means I don't discriminate between a national brand and a store brand or a private label. So you have four types of segments. So that's the conceptual thinking. So depending on the distribution of the market along these four broad segments, you will have distinct strategies. For So let me start, take the first one. Uh, you can't see this. People are only in this market. This is called the LED market, low end discriminators market, quadrant one. That means they are unwilling to buy the national brand, but they want a very high price differential to buy the store brand. They are not so willing to buy the store brand either. So what would you do? From, uh, and these are the kinds of strategy specifications that can be academically exciting, but also useful to the manager. So what would you do in that case? Do you have situations like this, rural marketing for instance? You know, they may not afford Colgate toothpaste, but you give them XYZ, you know, shop and stop toothpaste, they say, oh no, I'll never buy, put shop and stop toothpaste in my mouth. And that's the same thing, that is happening in toothpaste. To some extent, surprisingly, even in toothbrush, anything that you put right 
into the anatomy of your body has less resistance. So it doesn't have for household cleaning goods and stuff. So what would you do as a manager or as a strategist, what would you do in that case? First you can say, well, I want to change them to other situations. That's fine. We'll talk about what might be. But what can you do in that case? Is there anything that you can do at all or just give up? Beyond changing their perception, if only those people are there, you go to a rural market like Gurgaon or further down uh, and you find you're trying to sell toothpaste and they say, well, uh, one is to market to them. Uh, but let me go. So this is called the premium store. The point is you, because they don't believe in store brand, they believe in national brand, but they cannot afford it. So you have to create a store brand that mimics a national brand. That's the PSB is premium store brand strategy. And you have to price it just below what they are offering. Only these people are here. Just below so that these are the people who buy it. May not. So one strategy is to have a premium store brand. No national brand strategy. Obviously, what's the point having a national? This is for the retailer. We are always taking a retailer perspective. Uh, premium store brand, premium store brand, no switching because there's no national brand. Passive expansion strategy. Passive expansion strategy means you just keep it slightly lower price so that just these, only these group of people will buy it. Okay. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But the moment you start selling it as a store brand, for example, after a certain duration of time, wouldn't you start falling in the same perception that you know, this is also store brand and they might stop buying it again for the very same reason you started it? Uh, yeah, th that's a good point. Two or three things that you should do. One, you should not use your store name. You should create a name that is specific to you but not representing the store. So they think, like President's Choice by Loblaws is, uh, the Walmart has Sam's Choice, uh, which is their premier label. Great value is their low tier uh, private label. So generally when you create premium store brand, unless the entire, like Fab India, where then you're trying to signal your store's quality through your store brand, you try to stay away from sticking your store name to it so that they continue to think. Second is you have to do good packaging. Good packaging, they think, oh, yeah, cha, this is a good, good enough uh, thing. And the third is you shouldn't price too low that they think it's a cheap uh, brand. So those are the ways in which you continue. And the fourth, and very importantly, is you should have good quality. It's here even more important not to compromise on quality because like you said, after some time they try it out and they, it doesn't work, then they're going to say, oh my God, no, I don't want it anymore. Because we have a store called Decathlon, uh -huh. uh, which is into sports, all type of sports equipment uh -huh. and apparel and everything, shoes and anything to do with sports. Right. So they have some national brands like K2 and all, uh -huh. but they also have a lot of their local brands in, the, in different names. Uh -huh. so for example, uh -huh. running t-shirts in Romeo. Exactly. And Exactly. And Sometimes they may be even better than or better selling at least than the national brand themselves. Right. Where at one the price of oh, the really? Okay, so the, you do the price and thing too. There are different brands for each category. So for swimming, there's a different. Right. For yes, for yes. It's a different name. Absolutely. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Placement. Mm -hmm. you know, where you place your product, you place yes. your brand close to the national brand. Right. The affinity. Yes, and we'll come to that. We'll come to that. This is the very simplest case where you don't even have a national brand to worry about because they are, and it happens in rural markets. And it happens in, uh, in uh, Hispanic markets in the US, in Hispanics. So uh, uh, an Indian uh, lost his job in IT in US and he started a grocery store. So we, uh, so we asked him, Boy, there are, now there are every nook and corner in, in US, there is a grocery store, Indian grocery store. I said, oh my God, there's already so many people. Uh, why are you starting another grocery store? Do you think you will make money? He said, wow, who, you know, do you think I'm starting an Indian grocery store? No. 
I'm starting a uh, Hispanic grocery. This is an Indian guy starting a Hispanic grocery store. And the reason he said was, Indians have fewer children and spend a lot of money on each of their children for education. So they will send them to a top school and pay $50,000 or $60,000 in tuition fees. Hispanics are exactly the opposite. They will have a lot of children, but spend for each of them, or not spend them to education and stuff, but give them the best national brand food. So for them, their status is by, or nurturing of babies is by giving them national brand food. So they will never touch a store brand cereal. Uh, so in that, in that, but they cannot, some of them cannot afford the national brand. So if you make something look like a national brand, but not going there, a premium store brand, but with nothing else, even don't even, yeah. Yes. So the brand priced higher than the national Yes. So was I wrong? For the most part, yes. They, that is, you may call something as a premium store brand, but they don't necessarily have to be higher. Premium is in the eye of the beholder, of the quality. That doesn't necessarily need, in the store brand case only, need to be signaled as a higher priced product. The part of the reason is private labels grew out of it being value brands. That's the core proposition. So even if you have a premium brand, the value proposition shouldn't go away. It's a value proposition with high quality. So it can be higher priced, I'm not saying. So I did for pasta, where premium brands are, 70% of those who call themselves premium brands were priced at or lower than the leading national brand. So you're not wrong. It just said it is not necessary for it to be. Okay. So this is one, as I was going through in uh, Nilgiris, this was in Chennai. Uh, so I was taking pictures of it. Nilgiris has plum cakes, which I love actually. But they have no national brand at all. They only have Nilgiris brand of plum cakes. And they are very nicely packaged and very good quality. I'm surprised that they have. And on the others also, they had other. But to your point, maybe they shouldn't call them Nilgiris. They could be calling them something else. I think they have a sub-brand name also. I don't know if they have it here. Uh, so rich almond cake. So if you look at it, if I take out Nilgiris, everybody would think this is a national brand for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. See, the difference between regional brands, you say talking about regional versus private label is, if you sell in other retail outlets, it's a regional brand, absolutely not a store brand. Anytime you step yourself away from other, to other retail outlets, it's not a re store brand anymore afterwards. It's, uh, and that's what we call the wheel of retailing. People start out simple, having very niche positioning and stuff. As they grow, they start to expand and then they become much more generalized. So here is the, there's, that's one way. The other way is what we call a decoy national brand. We deliberately, and that has to do with even the Decathlon, the stores that you're talking about, sometimes the Nike t-shirts will be delibl deliberately priced at 200 rupees or 300 rupees so that you have a good t-shirt, but you sell it at 40 rupees, 50 rupees. So in fact, my father-in-law was, uh, was a, a supplier for Disney t-shirts, or tried to be huge market in Disney. And we have, we, uh, most of the imports were from here, and they could sell t-shirts for nearly two or five rupees per piece, cost, cost of t-shirts, uh, good, fairly good t-shirts. And all you do is put Disney name on it and sell it for 70 rupees or whatever it is that uh, over there, huge margin in between, between the person we get it from and the person who eventually sells it. 
and so you can create a so if you had a disney t-shirt which people some niche people are willing to pay 200 rupees for a nike t-shirt but your means your own store brand you have a good premium thing but sell it at 60 rupees or 80 rupees that's good so even that i would say is premium so long as you emphasize packaging and quality so if it still feels good and there are in fact a lot of my colleagues go to costco and get 15 dollar shirts the same thing outside is nearly 60 or 70 dollars it's almost the same thing so we buy cost shirts from Walmart and Costco, not this. This one is, a, a, but they have branded T-shirts also at very low price, and their own Costco T-shirts, uh, Costco shirts, the pants and shirts Costco sells in their own brands. In India, Costco only sells tennis, tennis balls. <laughs> what? If that's the same Costco. C O S T C O. S C O. That's. that's uh, that Costco, then it must be different. Then it is different. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think they, if there's. Costco is not in India. No, not in India. Uh, they should. They really should come. We have Tesco, we have Walmart now. Okay. B2B. Okay. Oh. Uh, so, uh, this was another example where Spencer's, Rose, no, don't worry about it. So, now let's think about. If you have people who are like you, who are available to, or who are willing to buy the national brand, which means their reservation price is more than this. So if the national brand can charge only two rupees in this case, but all the people can uh, buy or willing to pay more than two rupees or 20 rupees or something. And, but they are discriminators, which means they need a high price differential to switch to the store brand. They don't like store brand. So are there, pe I, there must be, that's what we thought as a big market once upon a time where people thought very low of store brands, but they were willing to pay the national brand. So from a strategy standpoint, what would you do? To, as if you're a store brand marketer, or what are all the possible brand strategies you can think of? What's the first brand strategy? So these people can afford the national, as a retailer, can afford the national brand, and they're the only people around. All this is zero, uh, but they are unwilling to buy the store brand. What's the first strategy which we have, including, uh, yeah, uh, in terms of which brands will you have in the retail outlet for if these are the only people in, on the market? What's the starting point? And then we will develop it from there. First thing is to have only the national brand. Don't even have the store brand. They are discriminators. They want you to charge a very low price to switch. Why do I have the store? That is the reason why in many product categories, we have only national brands and no store brand at all. Because most of them are willing to pay the national brand, but they are not, uh, they don't want to switch to the store brand. So why unnecessarily, yeah. Yes, there. yes. You could over time yes, change the yes. behavior of customers. That's very true. That's exactly the place where we are coming to. But you can't sustain. You're not going to be in control if all you do is sell national brand. So you have to find how do I slowly penetrate store brand into this market. So that's exactly right. The first strategy is if you are unable, and that's why a lot of mom and pop stores and relatively people with low investment or low uh, impetus to introduce store brands, because introducing store brand is not easy. Having a good private label program is not easy. It needs good supply chain, it needs good quality control, monitoring, merchandising, marketing abilities, and so forth. Sometimes niche areas could be, uh, for example, in Bangalore, Sandalwood. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people all over the country, when they go there, they pick it up. Yes, it's yes. priced higher than your last and your down. Yes. So you're talking about Mysore Sandal soap. Uh, is it a store brand or the national brand? That's not a store That's not a, See, you could have a sandal soap. If it's Mysore Sandal, it's a national brand. Yeah, I don't know if they have an equal local brand, store brand version. And that's a good... Absolutely. It's, I mean, Sandalwood pay is, is fairly low barrier to entry. 
if you have the supply of sandalwood or sandal, uh, whatever is the ingredient that relates to, you're right, and I have, we have that too as far. So the starting point is to have just national brand, uh, which is actually happening in Tide and Surf. Do you have yeah. uh, any store brand equivalent in? Uh, uh, detergents. Detergents, yeah. which is surprising. We have some there, but Tide and, there too, Tide dominates so much. The store brands are scared of getting into that, into that, uh, and that's the power of brand equity, which we're going to talk about. Uh, here, is Surf the leader or Tide the leader? Uh, according to the actual brief, it's Gadi. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I didn't know that, so. Oh, really? Okay, so it's not, so Gadi is a national brand? Yeah. So well, I've not heard of it. Oh, in the rural, oh, okay. It is now a national brand. Pretty much a national brand. It started from Kanpur and then it became all A big thing. Yeah. Just like even Amulan. Okay. Like the way Nirma used to be Nir Yeah, it's really Nirma in from Gujarat became a national brand. So it's really that kind of a... Oh, is that right? Okay. So that's one place where this is held. Uh, the other is lace. I'm talking about... In this was in Nilgiris. So this is in an Indian place where I saw... Uh, I didn't see Gaddi there. Uh, this is last year. Oh, this. So, potato chips, nobody dares enter the potato chips. Ma. But if you think about it, you or your grandma could make better potato chips than what Lay's does. Absolutely. And, but people say, in fact, even because Frito-Lay is based in Dallas, uh, and we know that, I know the CMO of Frito-Lay, and the CEO of Frito-Lay, Indra Nui, is, was a classmate, in the sense, four years senior to me. Uh, so, but they say, don't call it potato chips. First, they think they are in the salty snack market. They're not in the chips business. So to them, cashews, almonds, everything else, salty snacks is part of their... Uh, the second is they say they are not selling potato chips. They're selling lace potato chips. So you cannot separate <laughs> the brand from the product. It's like Xerox. I mean, for some time, people said Xeroxing versus copying. Just like we say Googling. For searching, search engine is, we always say Google. It's become a verb, noun, pronoun, adjective, everything. Uh, so that's the other. Now, uh, to your point, what's your name? Subodh. Subodh, yeah, Subodh. So the way you can make entry is through a premium store brand. You have to start with that. Doesn't mean you have to end with that. You start with the premium store brand to say, oh, we also have brands that can compete with national brands. Okay. But you got to only slightly, and this is the other part, you should not try to have a premium, unless you want a niche brand, and we'll come to that, I don't know if I have a, the, you, you don't want to put, if this is two dollars, see, all those who buy or more than two rupees will buy national brand, that's the way the color is. So if you price it at two rupees and two point five rupees or twenty five rupees, let's say you will get only this market. You will lose. This will be a left out market unnecessarily, or the national brand will take it. So in this case, you don't want. Even if you have a premium store brand, you don't want to completely price yourself out of that market. In this case, there may be other case. Reason: they are discriminators. They are biased towards national brand and that is what we are for. We marketers are for people to be biased towards the marketed brands. We are not into selling cheap brands. Uh, so I saw Tata Salt as one where they had good packaging and salt, what is the, uh, Tata Salt is a national brand, yeah. uh, right? And the Nilgiri Salt, was Spencer's Salt in this case, was reasonably good and priced just a little bit below that, actually, uh, and tried to get... Uh, the interesting thing is, they also, and that's where you... Uh, this we won't go into. When you do this, when you have a premium store brand competing with a national brand, how do you jointly promote? Which one do you promote and which one do you... Uh, in general, it is better, actually, to promote the national brand. Because the people who think, oh, this salt is good, is, but, but it's okay to switch so long as you get good trade deals on this. Uh, but that's that's a different story altogether. Which one? In this case, uh -huh. like, uh, okay, Tata salt, uh, one, get, buy one and get one. Right. So they may be slightly inferior to 
in fe- you would think that and that is a, in a way that's an okay thing for though if you're trying to compete here it's okay let them think that that is a relatively cheaper brand and then we get the advantage of the perception advantage of it right. yeah salt itself is a cheap product. yes and that's a commodity product kind of thing salt is they don't equate to that's true that's true it's not a hedonic or image oriented product so to what extent the the lower price will be reflected in lower perceived quality remains to be seen but just an example of how uh, the other is to have a pri- keep the national brand a little bit away create a higher priced national brand and then enter with the standard store brand okay the problem with this these are the people who will not buy your store brand because they are high discriminators but you have price these are people who would buy 2 rupee 20 rupees let's say national brand but they want a minimum of more than 10 rupees to buy the store brand so they will neither buy the national brand nor buy the store brand that's the le- red is the left out market so you have to trade off between the market you want to get how you want to price the national brand and those two will result in some market that may be left out that is they can't afford the national brand but they they will never buy the store brand even if you give them at a slightly cheaper price uh, so that's the so the for ta- taxonomy purposes we classify a standard store brand which means it will be comparable in quality to that of the national brand but not necessarily with the premium outlook uh, aggressive switching that means you try you pricing the national brand higher so that you can get the bulk of the market and no expansion strategy no expansion means this is the market and you have tried not to get out of that system we'll call we'll see about expansion strategy we saw passive expansion so uh, the one that example closest that i saw was in dates i was surprised zardi dates is that falcon zardi dates and there was spencer's had a smart choice dates which actually was bulk of the market it's a relatively small category but they had bulk of the shelf space and that goes back to the positioning in this case what you will do is you will position it right next to each other you will provide maybe more shelf space for the store brand and that you will have what you call shelf talkers say compare price of this with price of that shelf talkers are very very popular in in the united states uh, so this is how it was this is the actual thing it occupies much more space with this being tucked away so that spencer's smart choice and dates was the big thing uh, so now if you have so you can keep going that now what if you have two uh, segments you can go up to uh, in the paper i go up to all four segments so here is another way this is a starting point so here is so here these are low end discriminators that means they won't pay for the national brand and they don't like the store brand either these are high end discriminators that is they will pay for the store national brand but they don't like the store brand those are the two kinds of people so one is to say okay i don't care about these people they are cheap people anyway rural people low income people i don't care about them i will simply supply the national brand to those who are can afford it and be now you want to do better than that as a store brand strategist so then you create a premium store brand that now is the expansion strategy these are people who are never in the market in the first place maybe and that's the public policy implication why store brands offer consumer welfare is by offering a store brand you are able to at least cater to some market which was ignored in the past and this is even better than the first one that we showed where only these people were there and your premium store brand was supplying here now your premium store brand covers this national brand market and it cover takes a little bit of the people who would otherwise not be not, not go with diaper at all or not go with toothpaste at all because they cannot afford it they'll be using still the neem uh, twig or something branch for that so uh, that is one strategy the other strategy is to expand uh, use premium store brand to aggressively expand okay uh, 
So, and we can go keep going uh, that way. So, after you cover all of this, you build a taxonomy. The taxonomy is your taxonomy of store brand strategy. Your strategies depend on just two dimensions. Sometimes you can do complicated thinking, but at the end, you have to build it into a simpler, understandable framework. So here, really, two or three dimensions are involved. The first is, do you want to switch? The second is, do you want to expand the market? Those are the only two goals, or strategic goals. Eventually, that will lead to outcomes that are profitable. Don't think of, uh, do I want to make money or not? Obviously, we want to make money, uh, generally, and at least in the long term. So do you want to make money by switching uh, from the national brand, which has been the traditional view, or can you not, don't have to necessarily switch, but create expansion. So switching strategy, expansion strategy, some combination. So in this case, X is, and the, then the X is what type of store brand you want to use to achieve that strategy. Do you want to use a standard store brand, premium store brand, or economy store brand? Okay, economy store brand is a cheap one. Standard store brand is comparable one, and premium is better packaging and stuff. Uh, so that leads into, for instance, you can have a standard store brand, no switching, no expansion strategy. Uh, then uh, going to this, a standard store brand, total switching, premium, uh, passive expansion or aggressive. So you can even, there are some product categories in US and Aldi's is one example where in some categories, 100% are store brands. There are no national brands, anything. So, uh, so that's what I wanted to get to. Uh, so what I am, the reason I showed that, and again, it's, is even if I submit this to VK, VK is the editor of Journal of Marketing. He and I are practical you know, colleagues to some extent. A very good friend of mine. But if I send it to him, he'll reject it. Uh, the reason is he thinks this much of, you may do all conceptualizing, but there is no meat in it. So I have to go and collect data of some sort to validate this taxonomy or to gain insights from this taxonomy. So I'm going to do it somewhat internationally. I'm going to do in US, talk to some retailers, present a questionnaire based on this survey and say, what categories do you adopt this? Does it make sense? Uh, and so forth. And I want to do that in Europe, China, and India. So I'm looking for some people who can work in this area to be able to translate this conceptual framework into something that is meaningfully empirical. So that's where I'm in. Uh, for this part. So let me, uh, can you put the other one? Is that already there? Or, or yeah, 